Hello, my dear students. Welcome to Teacher at Home. Today, class, we are going to learn the chapter eight, Force and Laws of Motion. In the previous chapter, we described the motion of an object along a straight line in terms of its position, velocity, and acceleration. We saw that such a motion can be uniform or non-uniform. We have not yet discovered what causes the motion. Why does the speed of an object change with time? Do all motions require a cause? If so, what is the nature of this cause? In this chapter, we shall make an attempt to quench all such curiosities. For many centuries, the problem of motion and its causes had puzzled scientists and philosophers. A ball on the ground, when, is, when given a small heat, does not move forever. Such observations suggest the rest in the natural state of an object. This remained the belief until Galileo Galilei and Isaac Newton developed an entirely different approach to understand motion. In our everyday life, we observe that some effort is required to put a stationary object into motion or to stop a moving object. We ordinarily experience this is a muscular effort and say that we must push or heat or pull on the object to change its state of motion. The concept of force is based on this push, heat or pull. Let us now ponder about a force. What is it? In fact, no one has seen, tasted or felt a force. However, always see or feel the effect of a force. It can only be explained by describing what happens when a force is applied to an object. Pushing, heating and pulling of objects are always of bringing objects in motion. They move because we have a force that act on them. From your studies in earlier classes, you are also familiar with the fact that a force can be used to change the magnitude or velocity of an object or to change the direction of motion. We also know that a force can change the shape and size of the objects. Balanced and unbalanced forces. This figure shows a wooden block on a horizontal table, two strings, X and Y are tied to the two opposite faces of the block. If we apply a force by pulling the string X, the block begins to move to the right. Similarly, if we pull the string Y, the block moves to the left. But if the block is pulled from both the sides with equal force, the block will move. Such forces are called the balanced forces and do not change the state of rest of motion of an object. Now let us consider a situation in which Two opposite forces of different magnitudes pull the block. In this case, the block would begin to move in the direction of greater force. Thus, the two forces are not balanced and unbalanced force acts in the direction of the block moves. This suggests that a balanced force acting on an object brings it in motion. What happens when some children try to push a ball on the rough floor? They push the box with a small force. The box does not move because of friction acting in a direction opposite to the push. This friction force arises between two surfaces in contact. In this case, between the bottom of the four box and floor's rough surface, it balances the pushing force and therefore the box does not move. Children push the box harder but the box still does not move. This is because the friction force still balances the pushing force. If the children push the box harder still, the pushing force becomes bigger than the friction force. This is an unbalanced force, so the box starts moving. What happens when we ride a bicycle? When we stop pedaling, the bicycle begins to slow down. This is again because of the friction force acting opposite to the direction of motion. In order to keep the bicycle moving, we have to start pedaling again. It thus appears that an object maintains its motion under the continuous application of an unbalanced force. However, it is quite incorrect. An object moves with a uniform velocity when the forces acting on object are balanced and there is no net external force on it. If an unbalanced force is applied on the object, there will be change either in its speed or in the direction of motion. Thus, to accelerate the motion of an object, unbalanced force is required. And the change in its speed would continue as long as the unbalanced force is applied. However, if the force is removed completely, the object will continue to move with the velocity it has occurred till then. First laws of motion. By observing the motion of an object on an inclined plane, Galileo deduced that objects move with a constant speed when no force acts on them. 
he observed that when a marble rolls down an inclined plane its velocity increases in the next chapter you will learn that the marble falls under the unbalanced force of gravity as it rolls down and attains a definite velocity by the time it reaches the bottom its velocity decreases when it climbs up as shown here it shows a marble resting on an ideal frictionless plane inclined on both sides galileo argued that when the marble is released from left it would roll down the slope and go up on the opposite side to the same height from which it was released if the inclination of the plane on both sides are equal then the marble will climb the same distance that it covered while rolling down if the angle of inclination of the right side plane were gradually decreased then the marble would travel further distances till it reached the original height if the right side plane were ultimately made horizontal the marble would continue to travel forever reaching to trying to reach the same height that it was released from unbalanced forces on the marble in this case are zero it thus suggests that an unbalanced force is required to chain the motion of the marble but no net force is needed to sustain the uniform motion of the marble in practical situation it is difficult to achieve a zero unbalanced force this is because of the presence of the frictional force acting opposite to a direction of motion thus in practice the marble stops after traveling some distance effect of the frictional force may be minimized by using a smooth marble and a smooth plane providing a lubricant on top of the planes further newton further studied galileo's ideas on force and motion and presented the three fundamental laws that govern the motion of objects these three laws are known as newton's laws of motion the first law of motion is stated as an object remains in state a rest or a uniform motion in a straight line unless compelled to change that state by an applied force in other words all objects resist a change in their state of motion in a qualitative way the tendency to undisturbed objects to stay at rest or to keep moving with the same velocity is called inertia this is why the first law of motion is also known as the law of inertia certain experiences that we come across while traveling in a motor car can be explained on the basis of the law of inertia we tend to remain at rest with respect to the seat under the driver applies a braking force to stop the motor car with the application of brakes the car slows down but our body tends to continue in the same state of motion or because of its inertia a sudden application of brakes may thus cause injury to us by impact or collision with the particles in front safety belts are worn to prevent such accidents safety belts exert a force on our body to make the forward motion slower an opposite experience is encountered when we are standing in a bus and thus begins to bus begins to move suddenly now we tend to fall backwards this is because the sudden start of the bus brings motion to the bus as well as to our feet in contact with the floor of the bus but the rest of our body opposes the motion because of its inertia when a motor car makes a sharp turn at the high speed we tend to get thrown to one side this can again be explained on the basis of the law of inertia we tend to continue in our straight line motion when unbalanced force is applied by the engine to change the direction of motion in the motor car we slip to one side of the seat due to inertia of our body the fact that a body will remain at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force can be illustrated through the following activities make a pile of similar carom coins on a table attempt a sharp horizontal hit at the bottom of the pile using another carom coin or the striker if the hit is strong enough the bottom coin moves out quickly once the lowest coin is removed the inertia of other coins make them fall vertically on the table set a five rupee coin on a stiff card covering an empty glass tumbler standing on a table shown in figure 8.7 give the card a sharp horizontal flick with a finger if we do it fast then the card shoots away allowing the coin to fall vertically into the glass tumbler due to its inertia 
the inertia of the coin tries to maintain its state of rest even when the card flows off then next when the when the card is flipped with the finger the coin placed over it falls in the num tumbler place a water filled tumbler on a tray hold the tray and turn around as fast as you can observe that the water spills why observe that a groove is provided in a saucer for placing the tea cup it prevent the cup from toppling over in the case of sudden jerks inertia and mass all the examples and activities given so far illustrate that there is a resistance offered by an object to change its state of motion if it is at rest it tends to remain at rest if it is moving it tend to keep moving this property of an object is called its inertia do all bodies have the same inertia we know that it is easier to push an empty box than a box full of books similarly if we click a football it flies away but if we kick a stone on the same size with equal force it hardly moves we may in fact get an injury to our, into our foot while doing so similarly instead of a 5 rupee coin if we use a 1 rupee coin we find that lesser force is required to perform the activity a force that is just enough to cause a small chart to pick up large velocity will produce a negligible change in the motion of the train this is because in comparison to the cart the train has a much lesser density to change its state of motion accordingly we say that the train has more inertia than the cart clearly heavier or more massive objects offer larger inertia quantitatively the inertia of an object is measured by its mass we may thus relate inertia and mass as follows inertia is the natural tendency of an object to resist a change in its state of motion or at rest mass of an object is a measure of its inertia second law of motion the first law of motion indicates that when an unbalanced external force acts on an object its velocity changes that is the object get an acceleration we would now like to study how the acceleration of an object depends on the force applied to it and how we measure a force let us recount some observations from our everyday life during the game of table tennis if the ball hits a player it does not hurt him on the other hand when a fast moving cricket ball hits a spectator it may hurt him a truck at rest does not require any attention when parked along a road side but a moving truck even at speeds as low as 5 m per second may kill a person standing in its path a small mass such as bullet may kill a person when fired from a gun this observation suggests that the impact produced by the objects depend upon the mass and the velocity similarly if an object is to be accelerated we know that a greater force is required to give a larger greater velocity in other words it in other words there appears to exist some quantity of importance that combine the object's mass and velocity one such property called momentum was introduced by newton momentum p of an object is defined as the product of the mass and velocity that is p equal to mv momentum has both direction and magnitude its direction is same as that of velocity v si unit of momentum is kilogram meter per second since application of an unbalanced force brings a change in the velocity of an object it is therefore clear that a force also produces a change of momentum let us consider a situation in which a car with a dead battery is to be pushed along a straight road to give its speed of 1 meter per second which is sufficient to start its engine if one or two persons give a sudden push and balance force to it it hardly starts but a continuous push over some time results in a gradual acceleration of the car to the speed it means that the change of momentum of the car is not only determined by the magnitude of the force but also by the time during which the force is exerted it may then also be concluded that the force necessary to change the momentum of an object depend on the time rate at which the momentum is changed 
The second law of motion states that rate of change of momentum of an object is proportional to the applied unbalanced force in the direction of force. Mathematical formulation of second law of motion. Suppose an object of mass m is moving along a straight line with an initial velocity u. It is uniformly accelerated to velocity v in time t by the application of constant force f throughout the time t. Initial and final momentum of object will be P1 equal to mu and P2 equal to mv respectively. Change in momentum proportional to P2 minus P1, proportional to mv minus mu, m into v minus u, rate of change of momentum m into v minus u by t. Applied force F proportional to m into v minus u by t. F equal to km into v minus u by t is equal to kma. Here A is equal to V minus U by T is the acceleration, which is the rate of change of velocity. The quantity K is a constant of proportionality. The SI unit of mass and acceleration are kilogram and meter per second respectively. Unit of force is so chosen that the value of the constant K becomes 1. For this, one unit of force is defined as the amount that produces an acceleration of 1 meter per second in an object of 1 kilogram mass. 1 unit of force K into 1 kg into 1 meter per second. Thus the value of K becomes 1 now. F equal to MA. Unit of force is kilogram meter per second or Newton, which has the symbol N. The second law of motion gives us a method to measure the force acting on an object as a product of its mass and acceleration. The second law of motion is often seen in action in everyday life. Have you noticed that while catching a fast moving cricket ball, a fielder in the ground gradually pulls his hands backwards with the moving ball. In doing so, the fielder increases the time during which the high velocity of the moving ball decreases to zero. Thus, the acceleration of the ball is decreased and therefore the impact of catching the fast moving ball is also reduced. If the ball is stopped suddenly, then its high velocity decreases to zero in a very short interval of time. Thus, the rate of change of momentum of the ball will be large. Therefore, a large force would have to be applied for holding the cat that may hurt the palm of the fielder. In a high jump athletic event, athletes are made to fall either on a cushioned bed or a sand bed. This is to increase the time of the athlete's fall to stop after making the jump. This decreases the rate of change of momentum and hence the force. Try to ponder how a karate player breaks a slab of ice with a single ball. The first law of motion can be mathematically stated from the mathematical expression of the second law of motion. F is equal to ma. F is equal to mv minus u by t. Ft equal to mv minus mu. That is when f equal to 0, v equal to u for whatever time it is taken. This means that the object will continue moving with uniform velocity u throughout the time t. If u is 0, then v will be also 0. That is, the object will remain at rest. A constant force acts on an object of mass mkg for a duration of 2 seconds. It increases the object velocity from 3 meter per second to 7 meter per second. Find the magnitude of the applied force. Now if the force was applied for a duration of 5 seconds, what would be the final velocity of the object? We have been given that u equal to 3 meter per second and v equal to 7 meter per second, t equal to 2 second and m equal to 5 kg. We have f equal to m into v minus u by t. Substitution of values in the relation given, f is equal to 7 kg, 5 kg. Okay, that is 7 meter per second minus 3 meter per second divided by 2, we get 10 newton. Then, if this force is applied for a duration of 5 seconds, then the final velocity when be calculated as v is equal to u plus ft by m. Substituting the values, we get v equal to 13 meter per second which would require a greater force accelerator of 2 kg mass at 5 m per second or 4 kg mass at 2 m per second. From this, we have F is equal to Ma. M1 equal to 2 kg, A1 is equal to 5 m per second. M2 equal to 4 kg, A2 is equal to 2 m per second. So, F1 equal to M1 into A1, 2 kg into 5 m per second equal to 10 newton. F2 equal to M2A2 that is equal to 4 kg into 2 meter per second equal to 8 newton. 
So F1 it is greater than F2 acceleration. A 2 kg mass at a 5 meter per second would require a greater force. Next one, a motor car is moving with a velocity of 108 km per hour and it takes 4, meter, 4 seconds to stop after the brakes are applied. Calculate the force exerted by the brakes on the motor car if its mass along the passengers is 1000 kg. Initial velocity of the motor car U is equal to 108 km per hour. That is 108 into 1000 meter per second means 60 into 60. That is equal to 30 meter per second. And the final velocity of the motor car V is equal to 0 meter per second. Total mass of the motor car along with passengers is equal to 1000 kg. A time taken to stop the motor car T is equal to 4 seconds. From this we have the magnitude of the force applied by the brakes as M into V minus U by T. On substituting the values we get F is equal to 1000 kg into 0 minus 30 meter per second. That's uh, minus 7500 kilogram meter per second or minus 7500 Newton. Negative sign tells us the force exerted by the brakes is opposite to the direction of motion of the motor car. Next question, a force of 5 Newton give a mass m2, m1 acceleration 10 meter per second and a mass m2 an acceleration 20 meter per second. What acceleration would if we give both the masses were tied together? From this we have the equation m1 is equal to f by a1, m2 equal to f by a2, a1 is equal to 10 meter per second, a2 equal to 10, 20 meter per second and f is equal to 5 Newton. This m1 equal to 5 newton by 10 meter per second is equal to 0 0.50 kg and m2 equal to 5 newton by 20 meter per second equal to 0.25 kg. If the two masses were tied together, the total mass m would be m is equal to 0 0.50 kg plus 0.25 kg is equal to 0.75 kg. Acceleration produced in the combined mass of 5 newton force would be a is equal to f by m is equal to 5 newton by 0 0.75 kg is equal to 6.67 .6 meter per second. Velocity time graph of a ball of mass 20 gram moving along a straight line on a long table. How much force does the table exert on the ball to bring it to rest? Initial velocity of a ball is 20 centimeter per second due to the frictional force exerted by the table the velocity of the ball decreases down to 0 in 10 seconds. U is equal to 20 centimeter per second, V equal to 0 centimeter per second and T equal to 10 second. Since the velocity diagram is a straight line, it is clear that the ball move with a constant acceleration. Acceleration A is equal to V minus U by T. 0 centimeter per second minus 20 centimeter per second by 10 second is equal to minus 2 centimeter per second that is equal to 0 0.02 meter per second. The force exerted on the ball F is F equal to MA. 20 by 1000 kilogram into minus 0 0.02 meter per second is equal to minus 0 0.0004 Newton. Negative sign implies that the frictional force exerted by the table is opposite to the direction of motion of the ball. Third law of motion. The first laws of motion tell us how an applied force changes the motion provide us with a method of determining the force. Third law of motion states that when one object exerts a force on the other object a second object instantaneously exerts a force back on the first. These two forces are always equal in magnitude but opposite direction. These forces act on different objects and never on the same object. In the ball of football, sometimes we, while looking at the football and trying to kick it with a greater force, collide with the player at the opposite team. Both feel hurt because each applies a force to the other. In other words, there is a pair of forces and not just one force. The two opposing forces are also known as action and reaction forces. Let us consider two spring balance connected together as shown. The fixed end of the balance B is attacked with a rigid support like a wall. When a force is applied through the free end of the spring balance A, it is observed that both the spring balance show the same reading on the scales. It means that the force exerted by spring balance A on the balance B is equal but opposite in direction to the force exerted by the balance B on balance A. Any of the two forces can be called an action and the other is a reaction. This gives us an alternate statement of the third law of motion. To every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. 
However, it must be remembered that the action and reaction always act on two different objects simultaneously. Suppose you are standing at rest and insert a intent to start walking on the road. Must accelerate and thus requires a force in accordance with the second law of motion. What is this force? Is it the muscular effort you exert on the ground? Is it the direction we tend to move? No, you push the road below or uh, backwards. The road exerts an equal and opposite force on your feet to make your move forward. It is important to note that even though the action and reaction forces are always equal in magnitude, these forces may not produce acceleration of equal magnitude. This is because each force acts on a different object that may have a different mass. When a gun is fired, it exerts a forward force on the bullet. A bullet exerts an equal and opposite force on the gun. This results in the recoil of the gun. Since a gun has a much greater mass than the bullet, the acceleration of a gun is much less than the acceleration of the bullet. Third law of motion can be illustrated when a sailor jumps off a rowing boat. As the sailor jump forward, force on the boat move it backwards. So that's all about this chapter. If you are interested, please do like, share and subscribe my channel. Thank you.